I'm just going to read a few verses to you from the first epistle of John, 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. When John writes this epistle, you ask yourself the question, who is he writing to? And you know that in chapter 5, verse 13, he says, I write these things unto you that believe. To you that believe. He is not writing to convince them about the truth of the gospel. When he writes his gospel account, he says, I write to you that you might believe. He's urging them to believe. He's trying to convince them to believe in the gospel. But here he's writing to those who are already convinced, who already believe in the Lord Jesus. And as he writes this epistle, the first two chapters focus upon God in the sense that God is light. Now we know God is brightness. The apostle Paul, before he was Paul, the apostle was Saul of Tarsus. And on the Damascus road, he saw a light brighter than the sun at noonday. Jesus spoke to him. You know that in a coming day in the city, there's no need for a sun or the moon or the stars because God is the light of that place. But when you drill down, it's more than that, isn't it? God is holy. God is pure. God is clean. God is righteous. And we are called to live like that in light, not in darkness. To live holy lives. How do we do it? Well, God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And God's word as light focuses upon the one who said, I am the light of the world. And so our focus through God's word is on Jesus. And he calls us to say, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. They can only glorify our Father in heaven by becoming Christians themselves. And part of our light is to live lives of holiness and then to speak the light of God's word to people. But in chapters 3 and 4, John focuses upon God. God is not light so much this time. God is love. And it reminds us that God is relational. In the Godhead, there was love between the members of the Godhead. But that love was expressed sacrificially in the person of Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for our sins. We rejoice in that love, but we're called to express that love ourselves, to show a deep, sensitive care to people who are in need. Jesus showed it to us. We're called to show it to other people. Ultimately, it's meeting people's needs. That's what care and love is all about. The final thing we need to really bring to people is the message of the gospel, because that meets their deepest need, the need of the soul, the need of the spirit, their eternal needs. There may be other needs we've got to meet along the way, but we're called to reflect God's heart of love. And in chapter 5, we get John's third favorite word, really. You know, the Apostle Paul had favorite words. What were they? Faith, hope, love. John's favorite words seem to be light, love, and life. So in chapter 5, God is life. So if he's love and light, he's life as well. And the focus there is upon being born of God. Knowing Jesus is eternal life. 
And we have this life in God's Son. Life which is rich. A life which is full. A life which uh, is never-ending and starts the moment we knew Christ as Savior. And to watch a Christian die, as I watched my mother die, actually, I sat by her bedside, and over ten days she, she faded away. But there was a total peacefulness there. The reality of a God was in her. Why? Because she got God's life. And from the age of 19 to the age of 82, when she died, she never faltered in an assurance that she belonged to Jesus Christ. Because we've got that life, we can die well. And then you ask the question, why did he write this epistle? And he gives us one little clue in chapter 1 where he says, we write this to make your joy complete, or to make our joy complete. I'm writing these things, he says, so that you might have the fullness of joy. He's writing about Jesus. John had that great privilege, didn't he, of seeing the Lord in the flesh. And hearing the words of Jesus when he was mending his nets, Jesus told him, stop mending nets, broken nets. You're going to mend broken lives. He says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. John, your responsibility, follow me. That's all you have to do. My responsibility, I will make you fishers of men. And she said, we saw him, and we touched him, and we talked with him. John, of course, had the infinite privilege as well of seeing God, the Lord, in glory, and wrote the revelation on the Isle of Patmos. He saw that great vision, didn't he? But he said, I'm telling you about the Lord, so that your joy may be full. Our joy is a delight in God. And the delight is in doing God's will. Once we move away from that will, we can lose our joy. Once we lose our communion with God, we lose our joy. He says, I'm writing that your joy may be complete, your joy may be full. He gives us a second reason for writing in chapter 2, verse 1. He said, I write this to you so that you will not sin. I'm writing so that you'll stop sinning. Now he's saying, I know there's sin in your life. He said at the end of chapter 1. You can't escape the fact that sin in your life. So there's no sin in your life. You deceive yourself. The truth is not in you. And so he says, you've got to remember there's sin in your life, but I'm writing that you sin not. In other words, the habit of sin is broken. The power of sin is broken. And if we were to slip up, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He pleads on our behalf, and he's always successful. He's the propitiation for our sins. He's dealt with our sins on the cross. For that, we rejoice. But, of course, if we sin, we lose our joy. So the two reasons are connected. And then later on, he talks in chapter 2 of concerning those who would entice you away from the truth of the gospel, verse 26 in chapter 2. He says, these things have I written unto you concerning them, the author, I says, seduce you or lead you astray. In other words, those who would teach heresy concerning Jesus, who deny his deity or deny his humanity. He said, I'm warning you about this, because if you start believing heresy, you will lose your joy. And then, of course, he writes the third reason I write to you, that you may know that you have eternal life. Chapter 5, verse 13. That you might be assured, that you might have absolute confidence that you have eternal life. What robs us of joy is our sin. What robs us of joy is to believe something other than the gospel. What robs us of joy is to have doubts about our eternal security. And John is just reassuring us, shoring us up that we might have the fullness of joy. Let's just bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Father, thank you for the wonder of your word. Thank you for the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you that you're a God of light, of love, and of life. May we rejoice in these truths, Father, we pray. I know a deep walk with you through this day and in the days that lie ahead. And we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.